Welcome, my name is Marissa Miley and I'm senior editor at the Ground Truth Project. This is a Facebook Live Q&A from Africa to Atlanta, new approaches in the fight against HIV and AIDS. We are talking today with HIV AIDS expert Roger Shapiro, Associate Professor of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at the Harvard Chan School. This Q&A is jointly presented by the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Ground Truth Project. You can post your questions for Roger and me on our Facebook pages at Forum HSPH and at Ground Truth Project. What do you want to know about efforts to address HIV and AIDS around the world? So to help us launch our conversation today, I brought a short excerpt video from a project called Ending the Age of AIDS that Ground Truth has done with support from the Solutions Journalism Network and published in part with Time. An expanded version of this video was published on Time.com ahead of World AIDS Day, which was um, Sunday, December 1st. And in it, Ground Truth fellow Asha Stewart, a photojournalist, travels from Atlanta, her hometown, to Namibia in Southern Africa to document where we are in addressing HIV and AIDS. There are 1.1 million Americans living with HIV and more than half of all new transmissions are in the South. Black Americans are the most impacted by this crisis. If you're a gay black man, you have a one in two chance of contracting HIV and black heterosexual women face more risk than women of any other race or ethnicity. In fact, it's so bad, the scale of the HIV crisis in Atlanta mirrors that of African nations like Zimbabwe and South Africa. Together we will defeat AIDS in America and beyond. In his State of the Union address, President Trump set an ambitious goal to end the epidemic here by 2030. Experts are optimistic, but in reality, we're years behind the United Nations global targets. Namibia had one of the highest prevalence rates in the world, but is now one of just six countries that has achieved the UN goals. Programs here have focused specifically on the needs of women and girls who make up more than half of the HIV affected population. We visited a program called DREAMS, which uses education to address risk factors that allow the disease to spread, poverty and gender-based violence in particular. I followed police women, youth community organizers, social workers, nurses, and victims, who showed me how a hands-on approach and community-based solutions can create change. I think the most important thing to learn when it comes to treating illnesses that have a social nature is finding the pockets of people that get left behind and I think that's what needs to be emulated to see the same success elsewhere. But back home in Atlanta, I am struggling to understand the slow pace of progress in my own country and community. Frankly, the circumstances are a little bit different but the infection and disease itself looks very much the same whether you live in Namibia or you live in San Francisco. What's really important is that every single one of those data points in these large data sets is a person. It's a person in a family and it's a person in a community. So, um, Roger, as that clip showed, we've um, made major strides in the fight against HIV and AIDS, but there's still a lot of work to be done um, from Atlanta to Namibia, as we reported on, but also lots of places around the world. And so just wanted to begin with a, a, a broad question, <laughs> um, forgive me, but where are we in ending the global AIDS epidemic? Thanks. We're, we're at a really interesting time in the epidemic because we have great treatment for individuals. We have new drugs, powerful drugs that really keep people very healthy for, um, for long periods of time. And applying that to the epidemic is the challenge. So we know what to do. And we also, we also know that applying those drugs and treating as early as possible and as many people as possible is the best thing that we can do to solve the epidemic, to really, to really make progress. So we know what to do. And we also have really good metrics for how to measure what to do. And that's something called 90-90-90, which is uh, the UN program where we want at least 90% of people um, 
diagnosed who are HIV positive diagnosed or tested and, and diagnosed and then 90% should be getting onto treatment and then 90% should be virally suppressed because when you what we know from from projects and from studies is that the amount of virus in a population really translates to the the amount of new infections in the, the population so when you when you multiply those 90s all together um, it gives you the amount of circulating virus in the population, and that's how we can understand what the risk is. And so we really are at a, a point where we know what to do, and we've got great tools, but yet 1.7 million people still were infected last year. And so we still have a long way to go in applying those tools and getting countries and getting communities to that 90, 90, 90 level, and, be, and then once they reach that, beyond uh, that 90, mm -hmm. 90, 90. In Namibia, where our, our team of reporters um, reported, ASHA, along with Grand Chief Fellow Rachel Mueller, Senior Fellow William Martin, and Producer Patrice Howard, um, Namibia is one of the countries that has reached 90-90-90, and one of only six countries around the world, including um, Botswana, where I know that you've done a lot of research. Um, <clears throat> and was just curious, you've been working there since 1999. Um, you've certainly seen a lot of um, progress in the country and w was wondering if you could share with us what's been so critical to Botswana's success in meeting 90-90. Yeah, Botswana is <laughs> really, really, like Namibia, Botswana is really, um, has had an amazing approach to their HIV epidemic. It was, it was so, so, so affected in the 1990s that there was no way to ignore it. I mean, from, and, and what happened was that the president of the country really made it a priority. And President Mohai, who was the president in Botswana from 1998 to 2008, which were these critical years of the HIV epidemic, when just he came into office just as it became apparent what a disaster it really was there um, and, and, and how many people were affected, um, he, President Mohai basically destigmatized HIV. He um, pushed for a national treatment program starting in 2002. And then in 2004, he started a program where testing was opt out. So no special requirements needed to get an HIV test. Everyone should get tested unless they you know, refuse. But, but that made it much more available to get tested. And that's the way to get onto that ladder um, of getting treated, virally suppressed, and then really um, working towards um, you know, keeping the epidemic under control. So it sounds like strong political leadership mm -hmm. and um, certainly access to preventative and you know, testing and preventative services. What, what other success stories can we take from, it, from Botswana? I know that um, in particular you focused on um, mother to child transmission as well as um, more recently in infancy. Right. Um, and you know, how has focused on the, how, how has your focus on these two populations been so transformative? So when we first began working in Botswana in the, in the mid 1990s, the only thing we could do, the only thing we knew how to do at that point was to try to protect babies. So, so um, we went forward with research and the country went forward with a national program to try to prevent mother to child transmission using at first one drug and then ultimately multiple drugs to block transmission from a mother to child. Where if you don't do anything, it's 40% of the time or, or you will get a transmission. But with drugs, um, with, with treatment, you can block that down to now less than 1% of the time. So mother to child trans transmission prevention was one of the first success stories. And it was one of the first ways that we really um, were able to, to kind of see some hope in the epidemic um, and, and a way forward. Along the way, it's actually provided lessons for many of the things that we're using today in the general epidemic. For example, treatment as prevention uh, is re was really pioneered by treating a mother to prevent transmission to a child. And that is the, the, the really the, the hallmark of how we're treating a, uh, the, the epidemic today is treat everybody because when people are virally suppressed, they cannot transmit the virus. Those principles were really uh, first understood in mother to child transmission. Mm. So, so it's led us to places and then even in the treatment of children who do become infected, we've learned a lot about how early treatment can make a huge difference. And an infant's immu immune system is developing and, and if we treat really early in the child's life, ideally from birth, uh, we can make a huge difference in their, in their treatment outcomes. So we've learned a lot from 
that from the field of mother to child transmission, but then and likewise, um, infants are a vulnerable, vulnerable population. They're an exposed population to HIV and and vulnerable, and we can apply those same kind of lessons to you know the the more general epidemic as well. Mm -hmm. So. Um, how do we ensure that those drugs are getting to the vulnerable populations that need them? What, what are some steps that are being taken that have been models for, or there can be models for, yeah. whether in Botswana or elsewhere? Well, I think that, <clears throat> that gets back to political leadership and making sure that, you know, everybody has access to drugs. And we've done a good job with that. I mean, the, we are in a much better place now as a, in the world than we used to be. You know, more than 50% of people who need drugs are, get them, but that's still not enough, and we need to be at 100%. Um, but, you know, if you had had me here 10 years ago, it wouldn't have even been close to 50%. So, so there has been progress in getting, in getting drugs internationally to the places that need them, and domestically as well, you know, to the communities that need them here in the United States. But we could always be doing more. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the U.S. because um, a lot of our reporting focus on, on the Atlanta and, and uh, the epidemic in the American South, and the U.S. actually isn't one of the countries that's reached 90, 90, 90. Um, so we've had great strides ac across the country, um, improving access to treatment and ramping up preventative uh, services and education. Um, but as our, our fellow Juhi Bhatia reported for Time, um, there there is a protracted crisis in the, in the American South, where across the U.S., more than 1.1 million Americans are living with HIV and about 39,000 39, new infections every year. Um, and this is not equally distributed across the country. It's very concentrated in the South, um, where the southern states account for more than half of new HIV infections, and black, gay, and bisexual men are the most impacted. Um, so I was, was curious, why there is, why we've made so much progress in places like San Francisco and New York and elsewhere across the country, but there is this epidemic in the South. Yeah, it's a hard question to answer, but it, but it really comes down to um, understanding who is getting infected it, locally, because it's like politics. HIV is local, and 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 you have to understand your, ec ep your epidemic locally and understand where the barriers are to to accessing. Um, at-risk patients and uh, pay people and getting them treated, and where are the barriers to getting people on treatment and staying on treatment? And so stigma plays a huge role. And in, in the U.S. South, HIV is highly stigmatized. And I think that is, you know, one of the key barriers that needs to be overcome. But there's, there's both biological and social barriers. I mean, one, you know, one, one aspect biologically is, um, is we need to uh, look at sexually transmitted diseases rates because they can increase uh, HIV transmission. We look at male circumcision and lack of male circumcision as shown in every epidemic to be a risk factor. And then things that states and local governments can do is have the best fourth generation HIV test kits available. And that's not always the case in the South where, um, where we can determine earlier infection as well as just antibodies to existing infection. So, so there's some biological things, but then there's a, a whole lot of social determinants where, uh, where we need to reach the affected population. Yeah, um, one of the things that we documented in Namibia, um, as you mentioned, HIV is local, and I think which populations are most vulnerable changes depending on where you are. So in Namibia, um, women and girls are at most most risk of contracting HIV, um, where we learned that many women feel they don't have um, the right to demand safe sex or to get tested to access services. Um, and you know, one way of, of um, reducing the barrier to this care is, is through women's empowerment. And I know that your work on mother to child transmission has also touched on that. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how um, education and empowerment can um, um, improve access to care. Sure, I mean, the, the DREAM program that the PEPFAR funding provides is really a fantastic program in this regard because it targets the at-risk, vulnerable adolescent girls who are at risk in, in many parts of the world. And I think that's been, I think there, it's, showing, it's being shown to have success as we're seeing, we're seeing the first hints now that, that, um, that incidence is coming down in that 
in that group in Southern Africa, in places where there is an understanding of this. But, but still, it, three out of four new infections in that adolescent age group are among women, among girls. And that's, and that's uh, you know, really, really um, devastating for the epidemic because this is what's perpetuating the epidemic as cross-generational sex is, is, um, is bringing the epidemic to a whole new generation. And that's, what, that's a, a linkage that we need to break. Um, you know, the mother-to-child transmission aspect of this, what we have found in Botswana is that uh, many times a, 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 a girl or a, mother, or a woman finds out she's HIV infected for the first time when she's pregnant because that's when testing is applied. And, te and treatment is now offered very quickly. And there's really, really great rates of uptake in that, over 95% testing and treatment in pregnancy. So there's an empowerment in that uh, um, women for the first time can, can say, I'm gonna go on treatment, um, if, or sometimes for the first time they're finding out they're HIV infected, but, but it, there's a two for one. They're saying, I'm gonna protect my baby and I'm gonna do something for my own health. And what we found is that the motivation to protect uh, her baby is really, really strong and keeps women on treatment. And it also can keep them on treatment after she delivers and keep for her own health. And so we have found that these mother-child transmission programs can be leveraged into keeping a lot of women on treatment. And we know that it's the men that are hard to reach because they don't have access to health care. And, and pregnancy and, and delivery actually provides touch points with the health care system that do help treatment. So how is that takeaway kind of being applied outside of Botswana? Um, or to reach um, the men in Botswana, um, but but other kind of hard to reach populations. Well, it's it th that's not an easy question to answer because you know getting men in into the health health system and getting them tested is is not easy. So you need to be creative, and places have been creative. You know, there are there. Are, there are people who are saying, leave self-test kits out in public places and let, let us test ourselves. So there, there are, you know, so, you know not, may or may not work everywhere, but there are, there are various uh, approaches. You know, you mentioned San Francisco and New York, two cities who have had really great success reaching men, and because in, in those cities it's largely driven by uh, men who have sex with men, but, but finding ways to get men treated and, uh, and creatively, uh, you know, outreach to those populations in San Francisco, reaching out to homeless populations and mm -hmm. reaching out to you know exactly where is the epidemic, understanding their epidemic and understanding how to get treatment, testing first and then treatment to those places. Well, um, I could keep asking questions, but I want to give our Facebook audience a chance to chime in. So um, <clears throat> this first question comes from Tim. What, we've touched a little bit on this, but, but um, what are some of the emerging and most promising medical treatments for HIV and AIDS, um, which might be released onto the market in the next several years? And he asks, is a cure, so to speak, on the horizon? Great question. So um, we'd like to think a cure is on the horizon, and there are some really promising products. Um, a real sterilizing cure may be a little farther off in terms of a vaccine or is, is a little farther off and maybe more on a 10-year horizon. In the near future, though, we've got long-acting antiretrovirals, which could be a, a huge advantage in terms of keeping people uh, easily on their medication if it's a once-a-month injection or a once-a-month pill even, you know, or newer, newer options that um, become... Uh, really, really um, exciting when you think about ways to easily keep people on treatment. There's also, uh, we have broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, which are um, n n potentially a whole new way of treating HIV by providing antibodies that can control HIV. And there's lots of research going on now about um, ways to apply those to the epidemic. So I think there's um, some excitement in these traditional, in, in the traditional field of antiretrovirals, usually related to re having really good drugs, good classes of drugs that are longer acting, maybe some new products like broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, and then a little bit farther down the road, um, we still hope for a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, before I get to this next question, um, just for audience to give a little bit more context on the U.S., because something we reported on, um, but uh, earlier this year, President uh, Donald Trump announced a new HIV initiative, ending the HIV epidemic and asking Congress for $291 million um, that was targeting geographic hotspots across the U.S. to end the epidemic by 2030. Um, and what will be critical to reaching this goal? Um, what kind of 
whether the medical treatments that you just referred to earlier, um, and, and as well as the other um, treatment and preventative approaches we talked about. But I um, was curious if you could yeah. share with us your thoughts on that. Sure. So um, money is great, and making sure that that money uh, uh, is really applied um, in, a, in the smartest possible way, I think, is the, is the first step. So, thinking, so I think targeting the hotspots is really key. And I think CDC has done a good job, you know, seeing that as the as the right way forward uh, y you know y blanket approaches across the whole country are not as effective as really looking at where where transmissions occurring and so i i believe that's a, a good method i think getting human capital mobilized as well it's not just about money you have to have people in the communities where hiv is 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 being transmitted and 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 have people who are trusted by those communities. So it's it's really going to also involve a lot of mobilization of human capital and human you know and, and human resources um, inside those communities where the transmission is occurring to make a dent. Uh, um, but again, pointing to places that have had success, like San Francisco, which had fewer than 200 new infections last year wow. um, for the first time ever since the epidemic began and point to the fact that it's possible and you can really you can do it. Well, this is an interesting follow-up to that point. So this this the question comes in, a generation has grown up in the US with successful HIV AIDS treatment. Do you think that success has actually undermined prevention and have we become complacent? So that is a, a risk. Um, so many people want to check off this box. They want to check the box and say HIV that's a problem that's solved. Great, done. Let's move on to something else. Um, and we all wish that were the case, but the box isn't checked yet. And so as much as we appreciate great treatment and everyone who's infected can expect to live a normal, healthy life with these great medicines that are now available, the box hasn't been checked for the epidemic because people are still dying. And people, and most of the people who are dying are people who don't know they've got it, people who are marginalized from the healthcare system or, and not getting the treatment they need. So we, we haven't checked off the box. Um, but, uh, and so I think uh, we do have to be vigilant about not feeling like that. Um, this is a new question. Uh, the fight against HIV AIDS is also in some ways a story of women's rights. Success to some extent depends on women's ability to negotiate safe sex practices as well as have access to good and affordable health care. Um, have we seen progress in women's rights parallel the success of HIV AIDS prevention? That's a hard question yeah. for me to answer. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I do think that there are some silver linings to the HIV epidemic here in terms of women's empowerment and women's rights. And I mentioned earlier, you know, that we see that in mother to child transmission mm -hmm. and, and w with women sort of taking more control. Um, and then I think also the same lessons about um, power imbalances and inequities in sexual relationships, you know, all are have important implications for women's rights and for a lot of marginalized populations, you know, to, so these same messages about how to prevent HIV, I think, do, ha do resonate uh, on a broader level. Um, I, again, I'd like to say we've solved all these problems, but I think it's a work in progress. Um. Someone chimed in with a question, actually, that I think, um, well, I'll pose it to you, but I think, it, I think I might be able to answer it. Your clip shows impacts in the black community in the South. Did you find data in the trans community in the American South, too? I understand that's a growing problem. Um, maybe you can add, I'll just um, add that um, if you watch the fully expanded version of the clip, um, we do d document um, a program that's trying to track um, what's going on in the trans community in the South? Because right now, from my understanding, it's it's not it is undocumented. Right. Um, but maybe you can. Elaborate. My understanding is that they're a vulnerable group and a high risk group, but um, but more data probably needed. Yeah. So please check out the video on time.com. Um, <clears throat> we touched on stigma, which is a huge obstacle in um, overcoming HIV/AIDS, and was wondering what lessons from Botswana and Southern Africa um, can we take. Um, and apply globally? I think the first is stigma can be addressed from the top. 
And when the president addresses stigma, it makes a big difference. And that and that's, was the case in Botswana. I think that um, message came down to communities. And I think, um, and then it can be picked up and, and really championed at the community level. And we've seen communities come together and in ways that have really reduced stigma um, in terms of support, you know, by having support groups, and and other and 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 also, um, it, it can differ depending on the epidemic. So Botswana is a low population but very high prevalence HIV epidemic, and when every family is affected by HIV, like every family in Botswana has been, it 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 it, it can really do a lot to reduce stigma when people find, you know open up and just talk about it because every family can talk about their relative that they lost um, and 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 their own struggles I think it's uh, it's it's a different situation uh, perhaps in the American South where where HIV is highly stigmatized and maybe more marginalized and I think it's probably a much bigger problem than everybody realizes but we're not if we're not talking about it then we're not addressing stigma so I think the strategies for addressing stigma can vary depending on where mm -hmm. people live and and the and the the, the local nature of an epidemic, but the principles are the same, and stigma is really the most important thing to start with, um, you know, at the community level. Mm -hmm. um, this is a new question that, that um, just came in. How would you say, or sorry, what would you say has been the biggest success in the fight against HIV AIDS in the U.S. and in Africa? If I had to say, I would say U equals U. And for those who may not know what U equals U is, mm -hmm. it's undetectable equals untransmissible. So we have learned over the last several years that you cannot transmit HIV to your sexual partners if you are undetectable. And every study has borne that out. And, and it's really a game changer in terms of the way we think about uh, uh, addressing the epidemic, the way an individual thinks about how they live their life when they when they're HIV infected, and how their partners can can feel safe in, in you know if their partner is on treatment. So I, I think I think that U equals U is a fantastic a new understanding that we have, and really and highlights that the best way to treat the epidemic is to treat the individual. Um. Uh. So th this one is, um, wh what are the implications of the first newly discovered strain of HIV in two decades for treatment and prevention? I think those have more, that, that, uh, that discovery has more scientific uh, relevance, but very little relevance in terms of treatment. Okay. I think uh, there would be no difference in how that would be treated or managed. Okay. Um, just in, very grateful for your time, just sure. the, in the last question. Um, We've covered many different ways to address HIV around the world, um, but if you could pick successful ways, if you could pick just one, and, and maybe you, you touched on the U, U yeah. equals U, but maybe the most promising solution out there that needs our attention and our funding right now. Well, I think we've touched on some of them, mm -hmm. and certainly this understanding that um, U equals U is, is, is really a, a huge step forward. I haven't mentioned so far in the discussion is also using PrEP and the sort of smart application of, of, of using PrEP to you know, augment e the U equals U strategy um, is another. So yeah. by PrEP, I mean pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So it's, you, it's, it's taking uh, a pill for an un uninfected person to protect themselves. And that's also been a highly effective strategy for prevention of HIV, and when applied alongside of U equals U, is really, that's, that's our toolkit for addressing the epidemic. Um, we're always looking for new you know, solutions and, and better solutions, but, but I, as I said earlier, I think that, I think we're gonna have better versions of our existing tools in the near future. We always hope for a, a, a really super new tool, like a vaccine, mm -hmm. um, that we can employ, but we're not there yet. Um, so I, I do think, though, that um, I can return to where we started, which is the 90-90-90 metric, because that is a really powerful way for us to understand our local epidemics and our global epidemic. And, when, and, and it's given 
every locality the ability to understand how they're doing. And when you have an understanding of how they're doing and which piece they need to work on in that cascade, it really helps us fight. Uh, you figure out where to apply our resources and how to best fight it. And you can see these targets, you see you know, places moving towards the achievement of, their, of these goals. And I think that has been a huge step forward over the last few years. And I look forward to the, its continued success you know, going, going into the future. Great. Roger, it's been so nice to speak with you this morning. Um, encourage everyone out there to check out our reporting at thegroundtruthproject.org. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. See you.